to me watching and having followed the pandemic since January, seen South Korea, studied the Diamond Princess cruise ship, seen China, seen Taiwan, you know, seen that Hong Kong, Singapore, I was like, what are they doing? Hello again. Now, before we start properly, I just have to remind you that we're recording this talk today for broadcast on BBC Radio Scotland. It's going out this Sunday. The programme is Sunday morning with me, Sally Magnuson. It's on between 8 and 10 a.m. We'll have time for questions later, is what I also want to tell you. You can submit these questions online on the uh, Edinburgh uh, International Book Festival website, and we'll also be inviting them from our audience here at the Sculpture Court. Do please, if you wouldn't mind, in, in the audience here, switch any mobile phones off. A warm welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival and this event with Dr. Devi Sridhar, Professor of Global Public Health at the University of Edinburgh's Medical School. I'll be talking to Devi about how the pandemic's been handled, what politicians and maybe scientists have got right in her view and what they've got wrong, what we've learned as a result of it and how we can apply those lessons in the future. And maybe also if she'll indulge me, we'll talk a little about how she came to be where she is today, an American from an Indian family who grew up as the daughter of a renowned lung cancer specialist in Miami, Florida. Now, I was going to do uh, a long and uh, grave introduction mentioning some of her professional plaudits and uh, her uh, contributions uh, across the length of the pandemic so far to the, the public debate about COVID. Uh, she said, I read out to her what I was going to say, and she said, no, 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 no. All you need to tell them is that I've been involved with COVID, but I didn't cause it. <laughs> which is a reference to just one of the many accusations that have uh, come her way, and we'll talk about those uh, a little bit later on. She's also an instantly recognizable media figure for, for good or for ill, and I arrived here at the Edinburgh College of Art this morning to uh, find her besieged by cameras and standing <laughs> on a plinth, looking very fetching, uh, as you do. So, Devi, what an 18 months it's been. What's it been like for you in your various roles right at the heart of it? I am overwhelming. Even now, this is like the first in-person event I've done after being trapped in my study with Superman for 18 months. Um, so I think it's just, I guess, for all of us, how our lives have been affected by COVID-19 personally and professionally. Um, if I think of the moment, you know, when it first, getting that memo January 5th from the WHO that there was a cluster of cases tied to a seafood market, and of course you get many of these kind of notifications and thinking, hmm, what is this? Is it flu? Is it SARS? The Chinese government's going to handle this. And then January 16th in a fitness center reading about the lockdown of 60 million people over 500 cases, and you're thinking alarm bells going off, um, and then soon after, um, you know, seeing one of my friends who I work with, Jonine, who might be here today, there she is, and saying to her, she thought I was crazy, and I said, this is going to be the next pandemic. Start getting, you know, disinfectant <laughs> and hand sanitizer. And she's like, oh, you always are saying about that. And then where we are today, we're hundreds of millions of cases, um, millions of lives lost across the world, livelihoods affected. Um, it's, it's, it's been a tragic 18 months, an uplifting one to see vaccines come along, which we all hoped you know, science would deliver on, and just trying to stay positive and optimistic about today instead of kind of drowning under the burden of tomorrow of what could happen. So have I got everything right? No, I've probably gotten a lot wrong as social media reminds me every day. Um, I remember early on saying that, you know, I was asked in January, you know, should I worry if my pet gets it, my cat or dog? And I'm like, why am I being asked this? I was like, no, you shouldn't worry about it. And now there's advice from the CDC of stay away from your cat or dog if you have coronavirus. And I'm thinking, I got that wrong for sure. Um, we tried our best. We're human. We're flawed. We are well-meaning, well-intentioned, and just doing our best, I guess. That's all I can say. Well, we'll pick up some of the, the, the key moments along the way in, in a moment. But we have got the uh, luxury of a, a little bit longer than you normally get in your media appearances to talk. So 
can I go back a bit further now? When growing up in, in Florida, or perhaps it was later, I mean, when did this and how did this interest in, in public health come about? Yeah, and I mean, on that, you know, the hardest thing has been when I would do Good Morning Britain and have 30 seconds with Piers Morgan, and you're like, he's gonna interrupt me, talk faster. <laughs> don't mention Meghan Markle, don't mention veganism. Those are things that really upset him. <laughs> I was like, stay up message, and you're literally seeing like the 25 seconds, how do I convey the complexity of vaccines in 25 seconds? So this is luxurious in terms of time. Yeah, so um, my interest started when I, I was a teenager. My father was quite ill with cancer. He was um, diagnosed when I was 12 and went through years of um, chemo, um, eventually a uh, um, blood marrow transplant. I mean, really, um, you know, every time the thing about cancer is it, you think it's gone and then it comes back, right? So it's kind of that lingering ghost of, um, and it really had a profound effect on me because, you know, in Miami, you can imagine, you know, everyone's out partying, all my friends are out, and I was going to the hospital to kind of drive into chemo or back when I was 16, um, and then he died several months later, or I was kind of, you know, it was a different experience for me, and I was like, well, what's the point of having fancy cars or, you know, having, you know, a huge house, those things, if you're not healthy. You know, if you're healthy, you can enjoy life. You can do a lot with it. If you're not healthy, it's, every day is difficult. And I saw how, how much he suffered from being a really healthy 40-year-old um, to when he eventually died when he was 49. Um, you know, one of the fittest people I knew. Not fit like British fit, like American fit, like, you know, healthy and well. Um, that would be a weird thing to say about my dad. And so, um, yeah, so I guess that's, that's how it came in, and then I got, it was in medical school. I was a bit frustrated in medical school because it was very focused on individual patients, and I was like, yeah, but the reason they're coming in is because of something, like how do we prevent them getting ill? You know, how do we prevent people getting cancer? How do we prevent people getting diabetes? Um, what can we do in public health? And that for me is the difference between public health and medicine. Medicine is what do you do with the person who's ill in front of you, and public health is how do we keep them healthy so they never show up at a hospital or a clinic? Um, and in this pandemic as well, for me, the lesson has been not how do we build our hospitals to treat everyone, it's well, how do we make sure people don't get infected in the first place, it's what can we do in terms of our infrastructure. So I went to Oxford, that continued, spent um, an extended period in India trying to understand the challenges of low-income countries, and, um, and yeah, and I think it just went from there. I'm very interested in kind of health, well-being, um, if you follow my tweets, mental health. Sometimes I'm like a yoga teacher one day, and then people are like, why are you in that space? And I'm like, well, because we have to take care of our mental health as well as our physical health. And, and you're keen, uh, as a woman, on, on seeing more young women go into science and, and, and follow oh, their, their interests there. Definitely. And I think, I mean, if anything else, I know people got sick of seeing me. They'd be like, my friends knew it before, because I was on TV for Zika virus and Ebola. So when they saw me at the start of COVID, they're like, something bad is happening in the world, because that's when I start seeing you on TV. <laughs> And, um, and, you know, and, and, and I think the only kind of really nice thing I've gotten are letters from parents who have said, you know, my daughter is going to do medicine, um, or my daughter is going to do public health, or actually professors can come in all shapes and sizes and, you know, also have interests outside of being, you know, stuck in, in, in our classic view of what a professor is and what an academic is. So hopefully through this course of this pandemic, we've seen all kinds of professors. Um, we've been called all kinds of names, Professor Doom, Professor Lockdown, not, that's not me. Though, neither of them are me. I'm referring to my dear colleague, Neil Ferguson in London. Um, but I think there are all these things that have come out where I'm saying professors come in all shapes and sizes and hopefully women can be inspired to do whatever they want to do with that. So to take on this idea of the, the sort of um, aura of Cassandra that has, has um, <laughs> attended to follow you. At the Hay Festival back in 2018, you gave an illustration about why health challenges are so interconnected. Your example, and this was obviously a good time before COVID, was of someone being infected in China by an animal, that person then getting on a plane to the UK and the possible subsequent repercussions. When that was picked up, it pretty much labeled you as the, the Nostradamus of the coronavirus pandemic. And, and you've been in the, in the spotlight ever since. How did you come to um, predict this in such a, a sort of spookily accurate way? Yeah, so, um, so I've just finished a new book and actually one of the second sections is says, it's titled, no, it's not witchcraft, it's science. 
because um, I've been accused of witchcraft of saying, oh, she, you know, someone pulled out that clip. And the truth is, like, we knew this was going to happen. I mean, there, and it wasn't just me. I mean, you can look at so many prominent voices from Bill Gates to Angela Merkel to Barack Obama, and that was just kind of high-level political leaders. Ted, Dr. Tedros, head of the WHO, and then all the scientific community who had been racing to create the structures that we built off of to get the vaccines created. The, the research in the science community was kind of prepped for this. Um, and we knew that our most likely next pandemic would come from animals. That's where the bulk of our infectious diseases come from. Um, it would likely come from what we had seen from, you know, somewhere remote, let's say in sub-Saharan Africa, where we've seen, you know, Ebola and Marburg, or it might be coming from China or Southeast Asia, where we have seen, you know, antibiotic strains of bacteria emerging and spreading quickly because of the way animals are handled and kept close to humans. But I guess my illustration, the reason I was giving that, is that we have such a focus sometimes of what's happening within our borders and our communities. But actually, even now, this is why we're constantly, I call it almost like surveying the world of like what's happening with plague in Madagascar or yellow fever in Brazil or you know, Nipah virus in, in India, is that we know how interconnected we are and how that could be here. And that was kind of the example I gave. Um, and unfortunately, I wish I had been wrong. I wish that it, it, it wouldn't have happened, but in a way, there are all these looming existential threats, and it's just a question of, of time and chance till something like this would have happened. And it was your experience with, with Ebola that, that helped you to, to uh, get a grasp on the nature of the threats, wasn't it? And you were part of the independent panel, and you were, you were trying to tell governments what they needed to do in response to that. Yeah, so we kind of had, well, we've had a couple of test runs, let's say, for something like this. We've had SARS, MERS outbreaks, um, but also Ebola in 2014. And that was concentrated in West Africa. And fortunately, though Ebola kills more people and is um, more lethal, it spreads in a more difficult manner. It's really bodily fluids. It's not like through um, proximity to others and, and breathing and fomite. So it's much less transmissible, so it's easier to control. But it kind of was a test run for governments of what they would need to do to prepare for the next pandemic, because it was clear that we were not ready at that point for what could emerge. So that was a, um, a really, at least for me, kind of a learning experience of being involved with that and learning about infectious disease management, about the politics, the policies, about mobility across the world, how cases spread, um, and also for the WHO, who revised the World Health Organization, like changed their health emergency program based on that um, to try to kind of prepare for the next thing coming. I, so yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a good experience, a tragic experience, and much of what we've experienced in terms of lockdown, schools closed, you know, businesses shut, people at home, a lot of that have happened with Ebola in 2014, just not here. It was happening in Sierra Leone and Guinea and Liberia. So in a way, when people say, well, could you foresee lockdown? I was like, probably not here, but it was, has happened with infectious disease outbreaks in other contexts. And were you, um, were you advising uh, governments of that when the COVID uh, threat began to become clear? Well, not here. So most of my work before COVID was on low and middle income countries. So my research team, for example, I've had a researcher who was posted out to Haiti for a year looking at cholera and cholera management or malaria in Senegal or childhood pneumonia in Bangladesh. So we've really been focused because where are infectious diseases? They're largely in low and middle, middle income countries, things we don't think about here. Measles, cholera, plague, you know, these are things that um, are disturbing daily life in other places. And I really only got involved in the UK um, I really was sitting back, I was like, everything's fine, when there was the Prime Minister Boris Johnson's press briefing on March 12th, when he came out and said, we are stopping testing and tracing. I don't know if any of you remember that moment. Many of your loved ones are going to die, and you know, that's it. And, and, and to me, watching and having followed the pandemic since January, seen South Korea, studied the Diamond Princess cruise ship, seen China, seen Taiwan, you know, seen that Hong Kong, Singapore, I was like, what are they doing? And so I reflected on it overnight, and the next morning I put out a tweet thread, um, which was just saying, I don't, I don't think this is a good way that we're going. We don't need to have full lockdown like China, but what about stopping mass gatherings, asking people to work from home, giving better advice to people who are elderly about the risks of this and those who have underlying health issues? Because the only advice given at that point was like, don't go on cruise ships if you're over 70. And I'm not joking, that was, I mean, I would say as a public health person, don't go on cruise ships ever, but I will, I know that's gonna get me in trouble. I have had a cruise, uh, I hope, is there legal on this event? Because I've had a cruise, there's, 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 the cruise industry lobbyist wrote me very upset about my comments about cruise ships, but I just think cruise ships and infectious diseases are such, and not, they're not meant to go together. Um, and so 
Uh, yeah, so that was that moment, March 12th, and then I got kind of, and I tried along with other academics to be like, okay, what is the following the science? Like, what is the science they're following, right? Like, I just wanted to understand it. But SAGE at that point, the group that advises government, there was no idea of who was on it. The advice wasn't published. There was no minutes. So I was trying to figure out who was on it. Can I speak to one of the scientists who's on it? But I was quite secretive. So even people who were on it weren't saying they were on it. Um, and that's, I think, for historical reasons of how it operated for other events. And so I started, I wrote an article that um, Sunday in The Observer, in Sunday's Observer, which is called Britain's Gamble, which was saying, well, East Asia's done this, Hong Kong has done this, Singapore's done this, South Korea's done this, they're all going this direction and we're going this direction. <laughs> Maybe it'll work out, the idea of just living with it, because the idea at the start was just let it spread and, and, and hold, you know, hold ground. Maybe it won't. It's a risk, we don't know yet, but why are they all going there and we're going here? Um, and that kind of got me into doing more British media, yeah. So, so what, uh, now that you know, you've got a, a year and a half's experience to, to reflect on this, what did our governments in the UK get right with the pandemic and what did they get wrong? <laughs> I, have, I have a jokey answer, but I'll get in trouble with it. We'll talk about it later, but when, um, I think what we got right, let's be positive, vaccinations. Oh my goodness, what a celebration of science and of saving lives. Think of all, of, I hope all of you have been, um, if you are able to be doubly vaccinated and protected. I mean, the amount of lives that have been saved through that, and that is a tribute to British science, as well as and, you know, being able to acquire those doses. Um, and I know, I, I think my friend Emma might be here, and I know she's been running a vaccine center in Edinburgh, so you might have been vaccinated by her if you're local. But I mean, that's, how can we say, I mean, history is gonna look at this as, as a historical moment. I mean, when polio vaccines were created, there were parades in the streets. I mean, there was celebration of a breakthrough and that's, we haven't had that, but that's the euphoria we feel, those of us who have that protection. Also British science in terms of treatments, they set up within days what's called the recovery trial. So everyone being admitted to hospital became part of a trial to understand, you know, does, you know, um, hydrochloroquine uh, work? Does, um, you know, dexamethasone work? Do these treatments work? Can we repurpose medicines to have better effective clinical management? And that's been one of the best trials in the entire world to have real data on how do we save people's lives in hospital? Do these interventions make a difference? Um, so yeah, I think, of course I'm biased, I'm a scientist, but I think British science, and kind of, which is really international, I think of all the scientists we have from around the world, has been incredible. As well as I would say the British public in terms of compliance, the compliance over lockdown, astonishing. Do you think anyone would have projected that people would stay home, young people, and say, I'm going to stay home at 18 and not go see my friends because I'm gonna protect my grandparents and my neighbors? Um, so I think those are things that just still, I think, show the beauty of the human spirit and the human soul and how we look out for each other um, as people that we don't often see that on, online or on social media. And what did we get wrong? I think at the start was not running fast enough the way East Asia was going. So South Korea, I think is the really interesting one because from the start, they didn't wanna go into lockdown. They didn't wanna do what China did. They said, we're not, we're a democracy. We're not gonna lock people in their homes, take them to forced facilities. We're not gonna do that. But they also said, we're not gonna, let's live with it. And they used mass testing, tracing, isolation, IT, really good messaging, masks, diagnostics. So by the third week of January, they had contacted 20 diagnostic manufacturers and said, we need testing, mass testing. Um, we've gotten there in Britain. We have one of the best testing systems in the world. Really good sequencing and surveillance, but it took us a year and a half. We were a bit slow at the start with that and the cost of that messaging being poorer. Um, yeah, I mean, the other problem I think has been which we're seeing now, I mean, if you look at who's in hospital in Scotland now, it's largely, or in Britain as a whole, it's largely under 40s, unvaccinated under 40s. They had been told, if you would listen to some of the radio commentators at the start, that if you were under 50, you were immune. Just get the virus, right? It's only about over 80s, over 70s. That's clearly not true. Otherwise, we'd be through the crisis now. And, and we still are having hospitals filling up here with young people who are getting seriously ill. So I think that mixed messaging really confused people rather than consistency of you don't want to get it, this is how you can avoid getting it. You don't want to get it if you're 10 or if you're 20 or if you're 50 or if you're 80, and we're going to get diagnostics out, so if you're positive, you isolate, and we're going to support you to isolate and try to kind of keep a check on it until there was a scientific breakthrough, like a treatment or a vaccine. And what about those who've, who've argued, and there's been a, there's been a strong um, political lobby in, in, in some areas, to say that it has compromised our freedoms 
and actually the, the, the economic harms that have been done um, also lead to social harms and, and, and personal harms and psychological harms. And it's never been as simple as you know, the pure scientific response would suggest. Yeah, no, I think that's been a huge area of debate. Of course, you don't want to have the cure being worse than, than the disease, as they say, right? You don't want to chase, and this was the worry. If you think back to Britain and Sweden, and particularly Netherlands as well, the worry is, are we going to chase COVID and end up all falling off the cliff because we're like, have our eye off the ball of wider issues? And I guess my response to that is first, that the countries that have done better with their economies are those which managed to effectively suppress COVID down to a low enough level to keep economic activity going. The reason we go into lockdowns is because of health services collapsing. And when health services collapse, the COVID death rate jumps from what we ideally would think is you know, one or 2% or even lower to 10 or 20%. We're seeing that in developing countries. Um, you're having people my age, and I don't think of myself as that old yet, you know, dying in India because they can't get oxygen. I mean, it's, it's astonishing. And so that's why we had these harsh lockdowns. So how do you avoid the lockdown? You've got to keep your numbers low. And I think we should have focused on that. The trick of COVID from the start was governments is how do you keep your numbers low enough while keeping your economy open while waiting for a vaccine? That was the puzzle, right? And I think unfortunately trying to stay open without with surging infections forces you into a lockdown because- But then you have the likes of, of Australia, for instance, which was, you know, did very well and was lauded for the way that they went about it. Now they're having to lock down very hardly, harshly and they can't get enough people interested in being vaccinated. So this is the whole irony, and we've seen this with actually infectious diseases. The greatest resistance to getting vaccinated comes from people who aren't affected by the disease, right? So here we have resistance to getting MMR vaccines, measles, mumps, and rubella. So we have measles outbreaks. You go to parts of Africa, they're desperate for a measles vaccine. They walk hours for their kids to get it. And here we've seen the exact thing play out in Britain because we had, at the time the vaccine came along, a year of significant death um, health services overrun and lockdown, people ran towards the vaccine, right? Like as soon as they got their letter, they were excited. In Australia, because they've had a relatively normal life, they don't want to get vaccinated. And I think that's their only way out. Zero COVID, as it's called for me, was a very effective holding strategy, right? So you, you hold, you pause time, you say, we keep our cafes, gyms, retail, economy open, but we can't have mobility until the vaccine comes. So the real trick, the real puzzle now, I think, and we don't know, maybe I'll see you all in a year, and we'll see if I was wrong, is can Australia and New Zealand vaccinate the majority of their population, get to where we are now, without the deaths and the economic restrictions we face for that period of time? If they can, if New Zealand can escape this with like 26 deaths, astonishing. Australia, a few hundred deaths, amazing. And they've largely, their economic performance has been better than the other G7 countries, but Will their populations get vaccinated until they have significant devastation? That's the difficulty, I guess, and that's our, as humans, our cognitive bias. We don't understand it until we're affected by it. Let me ask you this. You've, you've never been afraid to, to criticize government decisions or indeed to wade into politics uh, itself now and then. The independence debate, for instance, you, you told the Politically Speaking podcast that Scotland would have done better against COVID as an independent country. Do you still think that? So I got kind of tricked into saying that, if I could say so myself. Um, but no, you I mean, said it. I did say it. I stand by it. Um, I think it was a very, very long interview, um, and it got kind of slipped in there. So I'm, I'm just a person from Miami who has ended up at the University of Edinburgh. My opinion, who cares? <laughs> I mean, it's just what I think. And I think it came when I said at the time it was my frustration that in Scotland we can do some things, but we can't do other things. And I was standing on um, you know, the Scottish COVID advisory group trying to understand as an American who was not really understanding the difference between Scotland. I mean, most Americans, um, and I'm being kind to them, cannot tell the difference between Scotland or England or Britain. They think it's all the same, right? They, they, it, takes, it takes you, you have to live here a few years to really understand, understand it. And there were things like, for example, last summer, genetic sequencing has shown that Scotland practically eliminated COVID. We didn't think it was possible. It happened through the first lockdown. And at that point, think of last July, there was like five cases being identified. And my view at that point is we gotta find those five cases through mass testing and then hold through the winter until we have a vaccine. Because we knew the winter was gonna be awful. We'd end up in another lockdown and we'd have a wave of infections even more deadly, which is unfortunately what happened. So my view is we knew vaccines were coming, early trials were looking incredibly promising, but we knew they wouldn't be there till January, 
to December, January. So I was like, well, how do we buy time for six months, give people in Scotland, kids in Scotland, a normal educational experience, get people back into jobs, and hold? And so my view on that was, well, we need to stop people moving in and out of the country, because then we're going to keep re-importing strains, which is what happened. We re-imported new strains in August. Um, and so that got dragged into that, because we obviously can't decide that alone in, 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 in Scotland. Same with financial powers to say, OK, we actually, this was at the time, I think when I made the comment, this was at the time when, I don't know if you remember, that the north of England was going into lockdown, and the Manchester mayor was really upset because they wouldn't have furlough payments. And he couldn't shut businesses because they couldn't provide economic support. And um, out of number 10, they weren't yet giving that guarantee. I don't know if you remember. Remember, they were like, we're not sure, and, and we don't know if we have the money. And the north of England was like, you don't care about us because you know, we're, we're having devastating rates. Um, and finally, the furlough was approved when London was having challenges. You know, and you could see that dynamic playing. And so, of course, I think in Scotland, it sometimes felt like nothing would move here in terms of economic powers until it affected London. So, can I? So that was kind of how I got dragged yeah, into Yeah, I mean, this can year. I invite you to make life even more difficult for yourself? Oh. <laughs> well, because you've been here longer now, and 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 I just wonder whether you you do think that uh -oh. Scotland would be handling this better if it were an independent country. And I, and I would say this to you so, so that it doesn't sound like a sort of biased question. There's going to be an inquiry into all the decisions that were, were made, but you know, there were surely plenty of things that the, the Scottish government was getting wrong all on its own. Um, but you know, what, what, what is your considered opinion now rather than looking back to when you made these remarks? This is going to end up being like headlines for the next two weeks and then like hundreds of thousands of messages. So that's what I see now when I speak. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think what I can say, having been in Scotland and seen it closely, is that I truly believe, and I'm going to get a lot of things perhaps by you thrown at my face, that the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, whatever your opinion on politics and independence, has tried to do a good job through this crisis. She has tried to brief the public. She has tried to message clearly. She has tried to listen to the scientists. Um, I talk about it in my book, actually, about our relationship, where I have never been pressured to say anything, never been told. It's actually been the opposite. It's always been, um, you know, what do you think without fear or favor? And because I'm kind of, again, like an American, I don't really want to go into government. I've killed any political ambitions by all the things I've said over the past 18 months, though I have a great friendship with Piers Morgan I can write at home about. Um, he's not popular in the States, I guess, now with his main comments. I mean, it's... You know, I think that kind of relationship is quite useful because I just say what I think. So on schools, I try to say effectively, what do I think is best for Scottish children? I don't have a stance in the political debate. So um, yeah, it's been a really tricky one. But all I can say is that I think I do feel fortunate to live in Scotland through this moment compared to being back in Florida. Florida is a mess. And I think it shows the importance of governance and leadership and of who's actually in charge. And in Florida, from a distance, might look great because it had no restrictions and everything is open and there's no mask mandates. But the result is many people hiding in their homes because they don't want to go to the supermarket because there's no masks. They know they're worried about getting ill because the hospitals are full. And they are full, Orlando, Miami. Um, and schools are, are kind of a mess where actually the wealthy are all homeschooling their kids because they can, they don't feel schools are safe, and the poor kids are either not in school at all and they're lost. I think in Miami, 10,000 kids have just been lost in the system, um, or they're in you know, environments where they're not really learning. So I think, in, I'm not comparing anything else, but I'm saying between Scotland and Florida, I'd rather be in Scotland right now. <laughs> Although actually, you must worry about your folks, your, your, your mother there. Yes, my mother is there, level, luckily, again, double vaccinated. Um, but again, she's really nervous because, yes, she could go party till 3 a.m. in a club if she wanted to, but she doesn't want to. She's at home largely. And I guess that shows that how important trust in government is because people no longer, I don't know if they trust authorities of saying what is safe and what is not safe. And that's definitely been reflected in the United States where I think because of former U.S. President Donald Trump's leadership, and now I'm going to get... Trump supporters onto me. But because of his leadership, I think there's like people don't know what to believe anymore because he said such, um, am I allowed, like utter crap? I would say, like, it was so, <laughs> I'm wondering if I'm gonna get bleeped out. I think that's, I think that's just about allowed. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking for another phrase and I couldn't come to one. I was like, I think here in this country you'd say utter rubbish, right? I mean, so people don't know what to believe, so it creates anarchy. Where I think one of the things like New Zealand, for example, has done well is there's one source of information and people trust it. And I think in Scotland, 
across Britain, I would say, in fact, because of the trust in the so in scientists, uptake is really high. Um, you know, uptake wouldn't be that high if people were believing that you were getting implanted with microchips that were tracking you for the next 10 years and COVID was a hoax. So, yeah. Let me Don't quote me on COVID as a hoax. Well, le le I mean, let me ask you about this clobbering that you get in, on social media. I mean, you tweeted this week, um, a couple of days ago, I don't want to be a punch bag anymore. I'm just an academic. Didn't cause COVID. I'm trying to explain simply what happened. Um, you know, we're laughing about this and, and, and sympathizing with you, but actually, how hard is it? And, and also, are you too reckless? I mean, do you just speak your mind too much? Do you, do you regret um, how much you engage on social media and, and just generally? This is reminding me of my mother's conversations to me when I was 18. <laughs> Um, ha, I mean, yes, of course I regret things I've said and, and done, um, don't we all, if we could go back in the past, I mean, if 18 Including months ago. Including coming here today? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I could go back 18 months, I was out in Dubai, I would have taken a connecting flight out to Auckland and then spent my year and a half on the beach there watching the rest of the world, no, I'm kidding, um, I, I would be here. And so on the first on social media, Every, almost everyone I've met in real life is really lovely. Um, even as scientists, you know, people think we disagree. And a lot of times it's normal that we disagree, but we disagree really respectfully. I've been on panels where scientific disagreement is normal and it's healthy. If I'm in a committee and everyone agrees, something is off. Something is really off with that committee. There's not enough diversity, there's not enough backgrounds, experiences, because with COVID, there's no right answer. These are trade-offs. This person wins, that person loses. It's all, it's a juggling act and it's changing. Look at variants. So we think we understood it and then Alpha came along and then we think we understood it then Delta came along and the vaccines and the pictures. So I think scientific disagreement is healthy. I think the way it's expressed on social media is really toxic. And this week I was feeling it because schools have gone back in Scotland and I've been, um, for better or worse, been seen as responsible again for schools. Um, though again, I have no formal role beyond advising, as, as alongside many others, um, the Scottish government on schools, and I get accusations of you're killing children by sending them into classrooms, and how could you be exposing children to infections, and infections are soaring in kids, and it's your fault, um, which I find really difficult, because if you actually look at my writing, I did a piece in The Guardian on children, it's really nuanced. It's, we don't want children to be infected, but we also know keeping kids out of school has additional harms in terms of social development, motor skills for younger kids, physical activity, even child protection. I mean, the number of kids who are getting beat up in their homes. Think of if you were a child in March 2020 and you heard schools were shutting and you were in a household with an alcoholic dad and a mom who was absent and you would not see another adult for the foreseeable future, not even your neighbors. Can you imagine that feeling? And so I think kind of my point is that it's really complex. And so then I also get other time people saying, well, you were the one responsible for child, you know, shutting child playgrounds and for you know, shutting schools. So I'm like, what am I responsible for? I'm not responsible for everything. Like I just explain is here. I try to understand and I try to share that with the public. Many scientific advisors, um, because of that scrutiny, hide from it. They don't like it because then you're challenged. Where my view has been like, people need to understand the trade-offs and the complexity of the decisions and the basis of it. And I've tried to do that, but on the course of doing it, you expose yourself, of course, to the court of public opinion. What about the other big question this week, um, which is what's growing now is whether 12 to 15 year olds should be vaccinated. Ministers in England certainly are reported today to be getting very frustrated with the JCVI, the, the, the vaccine panel that, that has been slow about coming to a conclusion on this. What's your view? Yeah, so I've made my views, I think, known quite widely, which is I think we should have progressed with the vaccination campaign in that age group. There's no mandatory vaccination, even for adults. It's not like you're being forced even to go, now even at the stage, you can go to a nightclub not being vaccinated. You can go to work. It's not, there's no vaccine mandate or man, it's an option. And kids should have that option, in my view, to be able to discuss with their families and a healthcare provider. When you get your vaccine, you do see a nurse or a GP who explains to you the risks of the vaccine and the benefits of getting it. And in my view, with Delta, because it is so infectious, children are going to get exposed to this. If not this week, 
in three weeks. If not in three weeks, in three months. We're heading into winter. So at least give parents and children the option of choosing to get vaccinated if they want to. And I'm also an international I'm, I'm kind of comparative scholar, so I like looking at different countries and learning from them. As I said at the start, learning from East Asia. And I'm looking at the United States, which has vaccinated millions of kids. I'm looking at Germany, where they've changed the recommendation to vaccinate 12 to 15 year olds because of Delta. I'm looking at Italy, and, and I'm looking at Israel, and I'm like, New Zealand, Australia even, can you believe they have such few cases, and they're going into vaccinating 12 to 15 year olds. And I'm like, well, what do we know that they don't know? Or what do they know that we don't know? Because in the end, the science is the same and the kids are the same, right? Like, and I think that's a little bit my frustration now with JCVI, because they're not saying not to vaccinate kids. They're saying we don't have enough information. We but it is, wait. I mean, it's incredibly difficult for, for parents wanting to do the right thing and just feeling at the back of their mind, what if? What if we discover down the line that, that vaccines are, are harmful for, for children at this age? I would never forgive myself. I mean, it, and the JCVI is, is presumably bearing all that in mind and trying to, to, to make sure that trust, broader trust in, in the vaccine program persists. I mean, I mean do, well, do you so understand the... the, the so we have two agencies. So the MHRA says if a vaccine is safe and effective, it's a regulatory agency equivalent to the FDA in the States. And they have said early on it is safe and effective, same for the Moderna vaccine. The JCVI recommends should we give that vaccine or not. You might think of something like chickenpox. The MHRA has said chickenpox vaccine is safe. The JCVI says we are not giving it for mass distribution. You can go to a private clinic and get it if you want. And so they have different roles. They're not saying it's not safe and effective. They're saying we don't know if we should prioritize giving it to these kids and if it's worth it. And I guess my view to those parents would say, well, imagine you could protect your child because we don't yet know the long-term effects of having COVID either. And there is long COVID, which we don't fully understand even now, which is some um, kids and young people seem to get prolonged symptoms from this. And it's things like heart enlargement and lung scarring and things that might go away, we might get a treatment for or not. So it's not a situation of you get the vaccine or nothing. Coming back to like the Australia, New Zealand example, the choices for the people there are not, ah, well, I get a vaccine, I'll just enjoy my life. No, the choice is, we're all, Delta's gonna be everywhere. There's no way we're gonna eradicate it at the global stage at this point. So at least give parents this, the choice, that's the real choice to parents, and that's why I think we should offer it. And then you know, people like MR here and other nurses and GPs can actually tell parents, these are the risks of the vaccine that we know about. This is the risk of COVID to your child. Do you want the vaccine based on this? It's informed consent. And I think that's the way we've operated with a lot of health issues. And so I get JCVI, but I feel like they don't feel the urgency I feel. Because every week I'm seeing the infections going up. English schools are gonna go back soon. They're gonna go up. We know the biggest rise in infections now is zero to 20. Those kids are going into crowded classrooms each day. And yeah, they're wearing masks, but masks we know in a classroom, they're gonna go to parties together, sleepovers. Time is ticking. So yes, in six months, they might come out and say, we recommend vaccinations to all. But at that point, if many of those kids have been infected already, that window has been lost. The window is really in the summer, I think, when the schools were closed. That's, okay. but in my opinion, who am I, right? <laughs> the others, they might have a different one, so. Let me ask you about the autumn surge that you've said is inevitable, and maybe we're seeing it now as cases uh, rise very alarmingly uh, again in Scotland. Nicola Sturgeon suggested that any reintroduction of restrictions um, is likely to depend on how seriously ill people get. Uh, what does that mean? So in the previous waves of infection, you could tell by cases what was coming. So you'd have cases go up, then you'd have hospitalizations, and you'd have deaths. It was like the sun rising and the sun setting, and you could understand it. Vaccines have changed that picture, and especially with Delta, people can test positive um, after being fully vaccinated, but they likelier to have a milder illness. They might you know, have a bad cold or a fever for a few days and get better. Should we treat those cases as equivalent to the ones in, let's say, someone who's unvaccinated and fully at risk? And that's the complex decision process we're in. I think the metric that we're looking at is what we call case conversion. So at, when, Wuhan, when the virus emerged at Wuhan, the big question was for hospitals, how many patients end up in hospital? And the number was 20% is what came out of China. So 20% of people who get infected end up in hospital. You can imagine at a population level, that's pretty high. And that's why China was building those huge hospitals in weeks, within a week. Then we in Britain got wider testing, asymptomatics, you know, there are people who just don't have symptoms. It came down to 10 to 12% of people who you would test who would end up. Vaccines have brought that down to three to 4%. They haven't broken the link, 
but they've weakened it considerably. And the worry now, I guess, and this is a really tricky one, is that if absolute numbers keep going up, so in Scotland, if we see that growth up and up, that three to 4% as an absolute number will overwhelm the NHS. There's just not that bandwidth. And so the really tricky thing is we can't disregard case numbers fully, but having, I think we're having the highest numbers we've ever had in Scotland are not translating to the same hospitalizations. They could be in cases of people who are younger, who have milder infection. They could be in people who are doubly vaccinated. And as long as we have a virus and Delta can infect people who are doubly vaccinated, those infections may not be equivalent to what we had in the past. So that, again, reveals the complexity. And again, even now with schools, kind of the plea I make sometimes is, you know, there might be 150 cases in a school. What we need to be knowing is of those 150 cases, how many were asymptomatic? Was it 100 or 120? How many had a mild cold? Was it 20 or 30? How many of those kids ended up in hospital? Was it one or two? How many had prolonged symptoms? And then we understand the picture. If we just look at 150 cases at this point of the pandemic, the knee-jerk response might be to shut that school. And then we start accruing all those other harms that are harder to quantify of kids being out of school, which we know are sadly many irreversible in terms of lifelong loss. Could Scotland stand another lockdown, do you think, if it ever came to that? I mean, do, do, you, think, do you think people would be willing, jaded and weary as they are, of, of going down that avenue again? I mean, I personally think it's unbearable. I mean, I think last winter was um, absolutely catastrophic for people. It was, and, and the, the silver lining was vaccines were coming. I remember I was doing a lot of media in December, and you know, the message I had to people thinking about Christmas was hold off till January, get your vaccine and have Christmas in February. You know, like survive this Christmas, you can be there for all the other Christmases because you saw the vaccine was there. So you had a reason to get through those difficult months and to wake up each morning and say, I'm gonna get through the day even if my life is, feeling much more meaningless than it did in the past. To reimpose restrictions now, I think, would just be very difficult because the question is, what is the exit? I mean, what are we now waiting for? But at the flip time, if hospitals are gonna collapse, that's not just for COVID, that's for everything else. Cancer treatments, surgeries, if your kid has appendicitis, if you have a heart attack, if you're in a car injury, hospitals collapsing is kind of the thing you want to avoid. And I'm looking at Florida again, and they are seeing hospitals turning away patients and this is a first world country because they don't have beds. Can you imagine that happening in Scotland? So that is the really, I think, very difficult predicament of this laid out, which is how do we get out of this? We've double vaccinated a huge part of the population and um, maybe we could vaccinate more under 40s with two, maybe we could do 12 to 15s. Um, with the flip side being hospital collapse is just unimaginable because then your excess mortality jumps, not because of COVID, because of all the other stuff. And, and the NHS staff are exhausted, they're burned out. Some of you might have be, be in the health service, some of you might know people closely who are in it. It's been a rough 18 months for them and it feels unfair to put them through another wave of infections when they're still recovering from two major waves we've had. What about boosters? The jury still seems to be out uh, on, on whether people beyond the very vulnerable um, and, and elderly will, will be getting them. Are you, in, are you in favor of boosters or is it even is it even fair to be thinking about them when, when so much of the world is, is waiting for a first vaccination? Yeah, it's such a difficult one because the main constraint to um, vaccinations across the world is supply. That's the main problem right now. We don't have enough doses. So of course, um, it's funny if it's not money because rich countries have been really happy to give money to poor countries. And what poor countries are saying is for once, they're like, we don't want the money, we want the vaccines. <laughs> you know, And even I think one saying, what's the point of money if you can't buy what we actually need to buy with it, which is doses. On the flip side, as I've just mentioned, this case conversion is really important. How many cases turned into hospitalizations? And that's how we stay out of lockdown. So if the choice for leaders of rich countries, whether it's Germany or Israel or Britain um, or the States is, okay, we give boosters and we can lower that case conversion down to 2% and keep more people out of hospital and stay out of restrictions, or actually that's morally unethical, we need to give doses abroad. I mean, what, what do you think a politician would do? Right? I mean, right now, can you imagine? I can't even imagine how any politician can get up and say we're reimposing restrictions. I, I would feel for them because I can't, there's, as you said, it's unimaginable. People would really kind of protest against that. So, this is the really difficult one. I mean, I guess the way I see it is that what this has reflected is how supply is the constraint and how the charity model doesn't work. So, the idea pre, you know, early on in COVID, May 2020, rich countries, all, the whole, you know, all countries got together at the World Health Assembly and they said, we're going to share 
We're going to share everything, and we're going to share doses. It's going to be fair, and it's going to be equitable, and we're going to make sure we give it. And then the pandemic hits, and they, and they took them all, right? They bought them all up. And now, you know, rich countries say, okay, the poor countries say, okay, you've done your, your, your populations, we need doses, and then rich countries say, no, we need boosters, right? And so what I'm hearing from, let's say, African scientists and colleagues is they're like, we don't want your charity anymore. Let us build factories on our continent. Let's build factories in Rwanda. Let's actually get the manufacturing to build for ourselves to stop asking you for doses and actually boost and get the emergency IP waiver to make what they see as the most promising mRNA vaccine, so Pfizer and Moderna, and actually stop asking you, I'm saying you, kind of rich countries, for your handouts when we know you won't look out for us anyways, even when our people are dying. So for me, that's the big lesson. And the other interesting thing on vaccines is Russia and China, who leaped ahead in approving their vaccines. Sputnik out of Russia, the first approved vaccine in August 2020, even before phase three trials were done, just raced ahead getting it out. Um, Sinovac, Sinopharm in China, and then Huawei, they're saying, well, UK and the US and Europe don't care about you, but we do. So here's our vaccines. You can have Sinovac, you can have Sinopharm, you can have Sputnik, you can have these doses. We're looking out for you, but in return, this is what we want, and kind of specifying and using that to actually leverage that kind of bitterness towards the West to start increasing their influence um, across the world as well. So that's the other dynamic now in this kind of global vaccination picture. Okay, well, thank you for that. We've, um, we've reached the last 15 minutes of our session and uh, it's time to hear what uh, your questions are. We've got uh, somebody with a hand up at the back there and uh, then beyond that up at the back. And we've also got some questions um, coming in online. Uh, let me just take um, one that's just appeared online because it's the subject we've been talking about here. Uh, I've heard there are 100,000 uh, AstraZeneca vaccines about to be thrown out as they're going out of date. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Isn't that a travesty when so many in other countries have none? I mean, is, yeah, is, is that the case? Are we, we, we're yeah. throwing out vaccines? I think, or their vaccines expiring. And I think the frustration for many um, low-income countries is they're getting vaccine deliveries, but they're vaccines that are expiring within a week. And they're like, how are we supposed to get this out within a week? Um, and so, yes there is an issue with vaccines expiring and, or being sent to countries when they're about to expire and countries being like, what are we supposed to do with 100,000 vaccines in a week and get them out? So that's a huge challenge. Thank you. Uh, let's take our first question from the floor. Yeah, we've heard in the media this week of, of declining effect of vaccines over time. And you've also just said boosters is a difficult issue. Is, we don't hear anything about research into better, more effective long-term vaccines. Do you, can you tell us anything about what's going on there? Yeah, so I think there's really exciting things happening there. There's the idea of a pan-coronavirus vaccine that has been making headway, which is a coronavirus vaccine that would not just be for SARS-CoV-2 and its variants, but also for MERS and for SARS and all the other threats of the family. And that is progressing really well and advancing. I think we will see scientific breakthroughs in the next five years that we couldn't have thought were possible. An HIV vaccine, it's not about COVID, but an HIV vaccine, a malaria vaccine, a universal flu vaccine. One of the problems with flu has been matching the right strain year to year. So out of New York, they've been doing trials of, I mean, it's almost, the way I explain it, it's almost like a, um, they try to match a particular strain to a vaccine. And so they're actually taking like four or five strains, taking bits off all of them and making like a combination of vaccines. Your body reacts to all of those bits. I am. So I think, yes, we're gonna see better developments. And the thing I think in COVID that'll be even better than a vaccine at this point would be like an antiviral therapy. Can you imagine if you test positive and you can take an antiviral therapy and it prevents long COVID and you're getting seriously ill? Transformative, and those trials are being undertaken. So it just shows time is so important because that's what scientists need to be able to get the vaccines made and the trials done for safety and effectiveness. While our camera moves to the next person in the, um uh, auditorium here. Here's a question from Derek in Perth. Should the Scottish Cabinet have invited opposition leaders into their decision making to avoid a lot of the political point scoring we've seen? A national government, he suggests, in a time of pandemic. Any thoughts? Well, all I would say, Jacinda did that, did she, in New Zealand? Whatever Jacinda did, I think, was good. <laughs> <laughs> I think... I think that's a yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's take our next question from the floor here. Thank you for the discussion. You keep on comparing the UK to East Asia. Uh, why aren't we comparing the UK to Sweden? 
Is it a result of uh, scientists loving uh, the, uh, the lockdown and along with governments? Because the Swedish option doesn't get discussed enough. The second question, please, is do you believe the numbers coming out of China uh, with the number of large cities with millions of people and such low cases? Thank you. So Sweden. Sweden and China. Um, so on China, um, so we, are the numbers as low as they say they are? So the reason I believe they are currently is because the measures they take are so extreme that, I mean, again, how comparable it is. So for example, there were 100 people who tested positive in China. They put into quarantine 45,000 people in institutional quarantine. Can you imagine that here in Scotland, right? That, and it's not like you quarantine at home and you go out for your walk and oops, maybe I went to the supermarket. No, it's like you go into a facility where you sit there for that time period. So I do believe that actually currently China is managing it effectively. I don't think they have COVID circulating, but the way they're managing it, I think, would probably be unacceptable to democracies across the world where people feel like they have a right to civil freedoms. Sweden. So Sweden is written about, and I do have a, a section on Sweden in my book, because the interesting thing about Sweden and Netherlands, Netherlands actually it didn't get as much international coverage, but looks very similar to Sweden, is they tried to stay away from mandatory restrictions and stay in voluntary ones that you tell people. They also have quite a healthy population and not a very unequal society. So there's certain things that are characteristic of Swedish society. And what they found is if you look a year and a half in at this winter, they imposed emergency legislation to legally shut down businesses because they had to manage their wave. And Netherlands as well, to the point that their advisors now say that while they are seen as exceptional, the Netherlands approach or the Sweden approach, that if you look across Europe, most countries did the same things and look very similarly in their responses. So I think we perhaps overstate how much differences there are. The rhetoric was different at the start, but in the end how it played out, they look pretty similarly on the ground um, in terms of um, how it was managed um, throughout it. But I think there are things they got right and there are things they got wrong in terms of the rhetoric. So at the start, I remember them saying that um, every country would face the same toll to this virus. It would be if your health services could manage it. So build your hospitals. That's clearly not true because the vaccine came along. And those countries that can vaccinate are not going to take those health tolls that were taken at the start. But on the flip side, I think they recognized the importance, for example, they kept schools open from the start. Um, again, it upset a lot of teachers and, 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 and they weren't testing in schools, but they recognize that actually there are parts of society that are essential to keep functioning. And so I don't, I'm not someone who thinks like, oh, Sweden bad or Sweden good. I said they tried a different approach. Unfortunately, it didn't work with such an infectious virus, but there are things we can take from it of, like all of us, what we got right and what we got wrong. Okay, thanks. I'll come to you, sir, in just a moment. Uh, uh, another question online from uh, Sally W. How do we change the narrative so that it's understood that restrictions are in fact protections and that exercising freedom not to get vaccinated, wear a mask, etc., deprives the many people who are clinically vulnerable of their freedom and sometimes even their lives? It's a really tricky one, right? Because there has been this thing of like, and I think the language around Freedom Day didn't help. I think the thing we try to say is we do have lots of things where we restrict our lives for the better of society. You can't go out and get smashed at a pub and then drive home legally because you could endanger others, right? There are restrictions on what you can do. There are restrictions on how we keep a society functioning and running where we see that we try to keep it safe. So I think we need to get away from the COVID exceptionalism of like, oh, we only have restrictions for COVID and say, actually, we do have restrictions in many parts of our lives to keep an effective society and a healthy society going um, moving forward. But I think now it's one of the things I think that we all have to be attentive of that um, you know, what our personal situation is different to others. There are people who have what we call hidden disabilities or hidden health issues that might look perfectly fine. There might be people we see at the school gates or at work or at supermarkets who actually will get really ill if they get COVID and are very worried or can't get vaccinated. So keeping that attentiveness that actually for some people, they want it to be over, but at the same time for others, you know, this is, this is gonna stress them for, for, for months to come. Okay, yes. First of all, to thank you for your Twitter feed, because as somebody that was shielding for over 12 months, it, it gave me a great deal of comfort. But just to talk a bit about those of us that were kind of hidden, I, I chose to shield before shielding was recommended. I saw what was coming and I was afraid, because I knew that if I got COVID, Potentially, I'd die, even though I'm only 37. 
So my question is, with all the uncertainty around boosters and all the contended issues around various things around vaccination going forward, what can society do better? What can governments do better to keep the most vulnerable like me in society safe? Thank you. Yeah. And thank you so much for being here today and your kind words on my Twitter feed, because I mostly hear, again, how reckless I'm being and why I should shut it down, which university management has tried several times unsuccessfully. They're like, you were supposed to stay off. Oh, really? I was like, I know. Oh, well, no, joking. I mean, oh. people are always like, did you really? So I'll take your serious question. But for example, I, I don't know if some of you saw, one Sunday I made a chocolate cake for breakfast in the middle of January and I ate it. It was Nigella's cake and it was yummy. And, um, and I just tweeted it saying I had a cake for breakfast and I got complaints to the university of how I was promoting unhealthy dietary habits <laughs> and how could I be a professor of public health and be having obesity and like telling this, which made me realize I should stay away from cake. <laughs> and, um, and so yes, university management, and I remember my line manager coming to me with a smile, you know, and, and talking to him and him being like, did you have to tweet your cake? And I was like, I didn't think of it. I was just like, it was, I was really proud of myself for like baking something um, and I wanted to share it. It's also like a millennial thing. Like we just like sharing some of the, and of course people think it's reckless. And listen, we will come to your question, but I just need to ask you this. Do you and Linda Bold, who's also public health at Edinburgh University, do you get together and bemoan your fate? Oh, so Linda and I have known each other from before because she has an office just down the hall from me and she used to go crazy because I'd always just pop in for a chat. And you know, when I chat, I stay for like two hours. So she would always be like, you know, I got a meeting and I'd be like, this couch is so comfy. And what do you think about this, Linda? Um, yeah, so Linda and I do talk regularly, if not on a daily or on a weekly basis. And she's just taken up a role in Scottish government on social policy. Um, and I have learned a lot from her of how to be less reckless and more cautious. <laughs> And, um, and, and, and try to stay away from political topics so I keep getting somehow into them. So, um, yeah, she's, so on your now, question. Yes, that was a very serious I think question, the, what governments and society so th can do better to help the most protect. vulnerable. So I think a true test of society is how it treats its most vulnerable. And that is true across the world. And I think one of the things, um, talking to advisors in East Asia, I remember talking to an advisor in Singapore, is they never had the debates that we had here about should we sacrifice so-and-so the elderly or should we sacrifice those sort of things for the healthy. I don't know if you remember these debates early on. They never had those. And I think that's really where we need to have like strong moral leadership from the top to say it's unacceptable for us even to have that. And we underestimate moral leadership. But again, we saw this with Donald Trump as president. When he would say things, it would embolden people to say things that were considered unacceptable. He, would, he, said, he, said, he said things, so others thought it was okay to say it. And I think here, having that moral leadership to say, it is not acceptable to have the elderly die if we can prevent their deaths. It is unacceptable to have those who are um, you know, immunocompromised or vulnerable die because we have to find a better way. And luckily, I think vaccines are providing a better way, but they're not 100%. And I think, again, that empathy and that kindness and that consideration you would have hoped through COVID, we would have become more empathetic, more kind, more open. And we have seen that, but we've also seen more anger, more frustration, and more bitterness. And just to say that, you know, the people who are vulnerable are not there. They're people like you. There are, there are loved ones. They're the people we live with. They're the people we see in our daily lives. And I think that just basic empathy to say it's different and we're going to do our best to try to protect um, those members of our society who are just as worthy of being here as, as we all are. Well, thank you very much for that question. And, and indeed for all your questions. We're just coming to the end, unfortunately, of our session now. Can I just ask one final question from me? Um, among all the things that may well uh, keep you awake at night, Devi, what is the thing that most does? What oh. um, worries you most, frightens you most as you, as you look ahead? So I don't want to freak everybody out, but um, <laughs> MERS acquiring pandemic potential is something that I'm very concerned about. And I don't know why I am. It's just, I think, because it's a virus that kills about a third of people, younger people. It spreads like SARS-CoV-2. And because of the way it spreads, it's usually if you get the virus, you're incredibly ill and you get ill quite quickly. So it's easier to stop the spread. But if some mutation happens, it allows it to have people spread it asymptomatically, as we've seen with SARS-CoV-2, or to have a longer period of incubation. They don't know they're ill, a pre-symptomatic phase, and spreads it. It would be very difficult to stop. 
So I think that's why I'm looking at this pan-coronavirus vaccine, because we have to have those vaccines ready to go. And on the positive side, since we should end, there is effort. So the effort now, which is exciting, is to move from 365 days from sequencing, finding a new pathogen, to a vaccine. It's now 100 days. Astonishing. So the mRNA vaccines can be designed in a weekend. And if we can have a lot of the trial processes ready to go, that means from the time we identify this is spreading to the time of jabs into arms, 100 days. And then the trick for government is how do you buy those 100 days without collapsing society and the economy? What do you do in those 100 days? Do you lock off your borders like New Zealand and say we're going to bubble you guys for, for those 100 days? Do you say actually um, you know, we're going to have to keep certain parts of society going? I mean, what do we do for those 100 days? Can we do anything better than lockdown? I mean, lockdown's pretty crude and rubbish and carries major harm. So I think that's the excitement now in science, which is nobody thought a vaccine was possible within a year. I can tell you that from the start. The vaccines take five years, 10 years, for especially we didn't have a coronavirus vaccine. So that should give you a lot of excitement. And if you do have people going, you know, going to university, you could say to them, that's something to work on, the 100-day challenge of, of actually that's going to save humanity in the next, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Devi, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your insights, for your honesty, um, for your, your wisdom. Um, that does bring our discussion at the Edinburgh International Book Festival to an end. Devi has a book out next year. It's called Preventable, The Politics of Pandemics and How to Stop the Next One. I think you can pre-order it. Goodness knows when you stop writing this, when the possible end to a book like that is, but uh, it's on its way next year. It is, and it's kind of transformed from a very serious academic book to, I kind of call it more kind of gossip girl, which is like um, very serious. But I mean, I think what people want to know is not anymore the data or the statistics. They want to know the story behind them. So it hopefully takes you into the room of the kind of decisions of getting caught in a spat, as I did last summer, between Ruth Davidson and Nicola Sturgeon and being like, Hi, I'm from Miami. I've just gotten back from paddleboarding, but what's up? What, what can I do to help? So I think hopefully you'll enjoy if you do manage to, to get a copy to, to read it and smile and cry and feel the emotions I felt the past two years. Well, we'll maybe find ourselves here next year talking uh, about it. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Professor Devi Sridhar for being our guest. <laughs>